Yo, what's up? I just finished reading this book, um, Megalith Studies in Stone, and what it is is a compilation of several different authors who are uh, like professional archaeologists and historians who study Neolithic sites. And I learned that there was a, a lot more to these Neolithic sites than ever understood. And um, we're going to go through some of that and kind of I'll summarize a lot of what they were saying. Sites like Stonehenge and um, Avebury and uh, Karnak and some of the most famous and impressive locations. They mainly go through the, the ones in um, England and France. That's where a lot of a lot of these sites were, but they talk about some from Africa and the Americas and the Middle East, like Gobleki Tepe. Um, I'll put pictures up so you can see what I mean because it's very complicated and I'm not the best at mathematics and stuff like that, especially astronomical mathematics. Hopefully I can ex explain it in a way that at least gets you interested. And if you are interested, you should definitely get that book or some other books on the subject. Um, so all I knew about Stonehenge was that it was a kind of solstice or equinox temple that had a fair number of alignments to like the midsummer and midwinter sunrises and sunsets and stuff like that. And that it, the stones were dragged some hundred miles, or some of the stones anyways, dragged a hundred miles into that location. And that's kind of as far as I, I thought it went. But as I found out, it goes a lot deeper than that. So you have that, that main circular area. And you actually have a little bit um, more than the stones we see. Some of it has been lost to construction and people would take the rocks for building material in a lot of these different locations and it's it's destroyed the sites a lot. They've deteriorated from what they used to be, but they've been able to do research and find out how it how these um, Neolithic sites actually looked. So we're just going to start by um, kind of talking about them and then we'll get into the more fringe mystery side of them. It's interesting because Neolithic sites are one of the only fields where the fringe is legitimately considered because of how because of how difficult and precise these sites would have been to um, make to construct. So Stonehenge was built actually over a couple thousand years. It was certainly not done in one generation and I'm not sure if we really will ever know if it was done by this same continuous group of people or if it was picked up by other people um, at various different points. They believe it was um, constructed as wood first and then later um, replaced by stone. So it certainly does align with the equinoxes and the solstices, but it's actually a counter for eclipses. Within the geometry of Stonehenge, and they call this astroarchaeology, because it's they they found out that they align to so many different cycles of astronomical events, like the eclipse. Um, I think it's called the Soros cycle, the um, which is an 18-year cycle, I believe, and then the Metonic cycle, I think, which is 19-year cycle, and that's when the sun and moon return to to their same places in the sky. Then you also have um, the Venus pentagram, so it also marks the when Venus returns to its same position, which I think is an eight year period. And in order to have these alignments, you need the level of geometry that they were able to um, pull off. You have perfect triangles, perfect rectangles, perfect circles, and when you have those kinds of geometrical shapes, you're able to create all these other kinds of shapes that can accurately capture when they're aligned with astronomical uh, celestial bodies, they're able to capture those movements almost down to, to the hour. 
And so in studying these sites, they not only are calendars, they're mathematical anomalies almost, just in the sense that to build these over thousands or a couple thousand years without losing that knowledge of where and how to align them and even how to to move that that stone and all that material is um is a mystery in and of itself but stonehenge not only has all of these geometrical and astronomical alignments it actually aligns with many different other sites in england and um and even some other parts of the world i'll put up the the image they make perfect triangles in certain locations there's um, a straight line called the Bellinus line that goes through what probably a dozen or so maybe more different sites and so they were not only built to these specifications they were built considering other sites that either existed before them or these other sites were built after Stonehenge and they were all built in context of each other and in Stonehenge's case they have really strange um, acoustic properties so they predict all kinds of different uses for this as a ritual as as a ritual temple as um, mapping out the stars and the planetary cycles the sun and moon and i think what's incredible is that you can tell by how they change uh, stonehenge from a wooden site to a stone site you can see that whoever built them intended them to to last forever for they built for not only themselves they built for for humans thousands and thousands of years into the future and i think that's i don't know it's certainly something we've lost today in that that sense of building something that really just has a more spiritual side to it for for the future whoever whatever group or person had that project in mind they certainly never saw it through in their lifetime and it's just incredible that these generations of people following them they all worked on it and eventually they did complete it but stonehenge is just one site and it's prob probably the most famous and it has such a wide um, variety of uses and alignments but just north of stonehenge is a site called avebury and avebury is actually the largest stone circle in the world and it has this um, kind of main section, and then it, and then it has two um, branching off pathways with their own circles. And the overall shape of it is thought to mimic or resemble a snake. So especially for Avebury, they think that it was there was some level of snake worship involved. But it has its own alignments and geometric and mathematical. Um, properties as well as um, just the enormity of the project of just whole rows of stones being um, being put up and I think especially for Avebury there's um, a lot of human um, interruption in the site there's buildings built around it and it, it doesn't look anything like it would have even probably a thousand years ago which is unfortunate and nearby to Avebury, you have this other place called Stanton Drew, and it's kind of this um, sort of plateau that was um, like ridged out, like it was platformed out, and they have some stone circles and then a number of wooden poles just kind of going in circle towards the middle. Again, they don't know what it was exactly used for, ritual hunting, festivals um some sort of you know game or festival and um and it has um nine concentric circles of these wooden posts and nine being a highly important number to mythology and astronomy i don't know if they have evidence of this or not but they believe that there could have been a roof to this site as well and um so it could have been a burial chamber it could have been some ritual hunting game or just festival location but just for like any of these sites imagine being like a neolithic person or even someone thousands of years after these sites were built 
and you're just with your buddies and you stumble on this on one of these sites and you you're just chilling there you've got some drugs or something and that that's kind of the magic in these neolithic sites right there is they're just like earth temples and they must have they must have been some incredible experiences there just um witnessing a solar eclipse while um while undergoing some music and intoxicant festival with a bunch of your with your your tribe or clan or just your buddies and outside of any other like specific religion religious usage for it that in and of itself is kind of the purpose of these places is they're they're there to experience this side of the world that um we're certainly disconnected from this kind of nature spirit side we have like tv and entertainment and all this stuff and to some extent this was kind of this these sites must have had that same level of kind of entertainment of watching a meteor shower or an eclipse or just the sunrise through these through the dolmens or gaps or circular gaps where you could directly see the sun and and that must have just been such an incredible experience but there's still so much more to these sites that we don't know and we may never know so b below england in france is this place called karnak and karnak is a um kind of a collection of a few sites that are again all aligned in these perfect rectangles with sites across um across geographic boundaries just huge um scale of alignments and they, you have this huge the grand men here is one site it's just this huge stone then you have the Erdeven alignments which are it's like 20 rows of just stone slabs kind of just like a huge garden of them also aligned in the karnak area is gavernus and gavernus is a is a cairn i believe it's overlooking the the ocean or it's near the ocean it might just be a lake but it's it's a cairn with um stones etched in that are that have these patterns and swirls and stuff like that but there's a um a spot in the entrance that the sun will at certain times shine a beam of light through the cairn to the back of it and it kind of goes at an angle and then once every i believe 18 years you have I believe it's when it goes to the horizon, when it's at its kind of lowest point in the horizon, this beam of moonlight crosses where the that solar sunrise crosses. And it creates this kind of imaginary uh, junction of those two rays of light through a point. Because in the very back of Gavernus is a quartz crystal that's in between those two beams of light. And so this whole thing was constructed to have that feature where this kind of imaginary juncture of the moon and sun crossing in what would be this center point where where this quartz crystal is. It's just incredible to think about. There's so many of these sites around the world, not just England and, and France, even if that's where the most famous and the highest number of them are, but there's a couple in Africa that resemble Stonehenge. There's some in India and Australia, Turkey and the Americas, and they're all incredible locations. And it's unfortunate because many of them haven't been restored. And even in Stonehenge's example, just a couple of years ago, the British government was trying to build a highway that pretty much goes right through Stonehenge. And when I think of that, I am reminded of uh, Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the Vogons destroy Earth to build a cosmic highway through it. And it's kind of just like that, where like it's just as it's simple to just go around, right? And it's I don't think there's any worth or justification in, in destroying these sites. They should be restored, I think. There's a magic to them that we don't even comprehend. 
that we're certainly missing out on. But now we've, we've gone to the point where we can talk about some of the fringe side to this thing. So records from our ancestors say that, they say giants built it. Some people put forth levitation. Um, then there's popular alien theories. And it's not like any of these theories are any less valid than the other. In order to get these astronomical and geometric alignments so good on top of spending, on top of having them go on for hundreds of years of building, and um, you know, especially when there's no clear like empire or kingdom or, or just record of, of a group of people doing that like we do with the, with the pyramids. And even those are not, and even with the pyramids, it's not all, people don't even agree on, on that completely. So it's not invalid to suggest aliens or levitation or some other metaphysical explanation or even giants or other mythical beasts. There's a mystery to it and there's a magic to that mystery and the sites themselves are incredible to behold. And then um, then you have this um, discussion of ley lines, these energetic currents that go through the earth, these sort of veins of energy. And they're said to align through them, dowsers and um, geomancers in Chinese that's called feng shui. It's the sense that the earth has these lines, these major um, meridians, and then from those meridians you have branching um, sort of telluric lines and um, just shapes of kind of electromagnetic fields that you can harness that power with these kinds of sites, especially something like Stonehenge that has all these other alignments on top of being on these alleged ley lines and um, other sites which are said to have those kind of swirling patterns of, of energy. Now I'm going to offer an explanation for what I think or how I think this works, just the, the zodiac and the constellations and these metaphysical ideas of ley lines and energy because um, there's definitely something to it and I don't think that the new age movement, they kind of... Um, I know, they, they kind of make it sound ridiculous and and just all fanciful when I think how I think it works and how I think it should be explained. So the Earth forming billions of years ago, and you have all these different planets and stars and the sun and moon, and they're all exerting light and um, or some sort of gravitational pull, and they're going in patterns, and they're going in patterns for millions and millions of years before Earth was ever even created. And those patterns are like invisible strings that slowly influence and just have a subtle effect on, on the Earth. But when you take a look at the pattern of these orbits, they make very intricate geometric shapes, like the Venus flower, or the, or the Venus pentagram, as, it called, as it's called, which it, um, Stonehenge is aligned to. And so these, they're going in these patterns for billions of years. And the Earth itself, in its formation, its electromagnetism is being affected by that. And when life starts to spring out, it has these same influences touching on it. We all have electromagnetic fields. We all have the effects of gravity on us and these planets just going in these patterns for billions of years. They have certain very minute effects, but it's a minute effect that's been happening for billions of years, right? So that's where there's noticeable differences in um, in certain zodiacal positions because they're so ingrained in the Earth itself and the electromagnetic field in the formation of ley lines and the just that sort of metaphysical electromagnetism that we are in a sense behind in understanding because it, all the indications suggest that these ancient Neolithic builders knew about all of this and they knew about these geometric patterns of the constellation and the stars and the sun and the moon and took advantage of it or built locations to heighten those effects for whatever sort of spiritual ritual or just just to have that experience 
that's why they did it. I know I didn't necessarily explain things too well, especially on the mathematics side, which is, that's just not what I'm good at. So if you're interested to learn more about it, and I think everyone should learn, learn more about it because it takes us away from the, the empirical evidence that everyone's obsessed with in kind of this Cartesian mindset. And um, because no one has the answers to this, yet we know they're here and we know they have these alignments. And it's, it's not coincidence because of how consistent they are with these alignments. And people have studied hundreds of sites and they all use the same measurement. I think it's good to have that, those questions of mystery that you can't solve with science and you can't solve with religion either. It's good to have that mystery because we're, we've become so polarized in needing empirical data and having blind faith when there's questions out there where neither one can sufficiently answer and people just need to not be so caught up in that and to understand that there is mystery. And I think these, these ancient sites have something that can really speak to us in that, you know, whatever spiritual way. We should certainly learn more about them and we should restore them. And, and just to end it on a final thought, the, um, the significance of snake worship or possible snake worship and um, ritual drug use, these are probably some of the locations, just even with not just Stonehenge, but like Gobleki Tepe, where you have probably the many origins of our founding mythologies that would later become our major religions. A lot of that could have taken place at some of these sites, um, which often involves plants or mushroom hallucinogens. So just something to consider as well, I think. But yeah, if I got you interested, I definitely didn't cover even like 5% of what's in this book. Um, it's a very easy read with lots of pictures. Pretty much all the pictures I used for this are, are I just captured from the book. Hopefully I, that doesn't give me like a trouble or anything, but um, there's, there's stuff about rock art and, um, and many other sites and they go into the actual process of how it was surveyed and what people thought of it hundreds of years ago and um, the early history of just recording and trying to figure out what these sites were and the mathematics and astro archeology span um, of these ancient Neolithic megalith sites. Thanks for watching.